I do ask that you would stand with me for the reading of God's Word. So we read the passage before the message this morning in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we will be reading verses 33 to 37. Just give you a moment to find your way there. Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Again, you have heard it, that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You may be seated. Good morning. As always, it is a joy to be among the people of God as we come together to join in the corporate and public worship of our Lord and Savior. By God's grace, we have been given yet another week to grow into the likeness of Christ. And now we turn our attention back to the gospel according to Matthew toward that aim. It's the purpose of what we do is to worship our King and to grow into the likeness of our Savior. Do not murder your brother by harboring hatred toward him. Do not commit adultery against your spouse by lusting after another. Do not break your marriage covenant through adultery or divorce your, your, or divorce your spouse and cause them to commit adultery. Well, so far in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been dealing with some very weighty issues. He has made several radical statements that, yes, they would have been considered very radical statements even in his day. And he has presented a completely new paradigm and how to understand what the law of God demanded, and the kind of obedience that Jesus Christ was calling his disciples to. We can imagine after those statements that I just reminded us of, the anxious state of those that were standing around Jesus, listening to his teaching. I'm sure they were asking themselves silently in their minds, what is coming next? What are we going to be hit with next? Well, as they braced for the next life-altering statement from our Lord, there might have been some temptation to breathe a sigh of relief when they heard Jesus begin to speak about swearing oaths. Surely what would follow could not be as difficult as what already had been said. Breaking a promise can't be as bad or important as murder, adultery, and divorce. How much was this really going to matter? How much would this really affect me? I think what we're going to see is that God cares a great deal about how well we keep our promises. God cares a great deal about how we talk and what we say. He is concerned about how careful we are in taking, taking his name or his word and using them as a part of our conversation. He cares about our using his name or his word as tools of manipulation. Well, why is this so important? This is important because truthfulness and faithfulness are at the very core of who God is. It's at the very core of how we were designed to bear God's image and dominion over all of creation. It is important because his name is maligned each and every time it is invoked for sure as surety for a promise that was never going to be kept. It is important because the words and actions of God's people who are called after his name affects how the unbelieving world will understand the truthfulness and the faithfulness of the God we claim to serve. Well, as we arrive at our passage this morning that was just read for us a few moments ago, we find the first account where Jesus dealt with this issue of the taking of oaths or swearing an oath. 
And he was, he was dealing with the flippancy, the carelessness with which so many men of that time, even the leaders of the people, had begun to treat the man, a man's word. Far from living up to our design as God had made us, in the image of God, according to the nature of God, men had become faithless. They had even become faithless to themselves and to their own words. Worse than that, they had twisted the commands of God. And they, these commands that were given by God as a grace to stem the effects of sin among the people. And instead, they had made God's words into tools of manipulation and deception. This morning, we are going to spend some time first looking at God's character and man's purpose to display God's character and his truthfulness in creation. After that, we will look at the commands that were given to Moses in the wake of man's inability to remain faithful as a way to stem the tide or to hold back the effects of man's faithlessness. Then we're going to look at how the traditions were developed among the scribes and the Pharisees, taking those words of Moses and twisting them into bringing about action that was not at all in line with the original commandments. Following that, we will look at Jesus' critique, his response to the traditions of the men. And then finally, we're going to take some time to consider how we should respond to Jesus' words. We'll look at whether or not swearing an oath has any place in the Christian life today. Well, before we take on this, this hefty task, I would ask you to join me in prayer. Father, I pray that you would keep me from speaking falsehood this morning, that you would especially hold me back from using your words or your name to advance anything that isn't from you, to advance anything that isn't of your word according to the meaning that it was given through your spirit as it was written. Father, I pray that I might be a faithful messenger of your word this morning, that your people would hear, that your spirit would work within your people to conform us to Christ. I thank you that we do have your promise that when your word is proclaimed, that it will not return empty or void. It will accomplish its task. So, Father, we, we pray for and we expect, because of your promises, to see a working of your spirit today for the good of your people, for the glory of your name. Remove any distraction that the preacher might provide. You receive all the honor and glory and praise. Amen. Well, let's start back at the beginning. What was God's design for language and communication in creation? We're not going to turn there now, but you can remember and you can read later on this week. Time and again, in, through Genesis 1, we read that God spoke, and then the perfection of his thoughts, so what he had imagined in his mind, was captured perfectly in his words, and then was translated into the physical universe. So God spoke, and the full truth of his words became reality, in his words, there was no confusion. In his words, there was no doubt. In his words, there was an absolute guarantee that what he said was true and would come to pass exactly as he intended. Well, you might ask me, why go all the way back to creation if we're trying to look at what does Jesus mean when he's talking about swearing an oath? But it's because the first spoken words in history lay down the pattern that all spoken words were meant to follow. In those first spoken words of God, speaking creation into existence, what was said was thoughtful, it was intentional, it was purposeful, it was dependable, and it coincided perfectly with reality. That is the intended design for language and communication in God's creation. 
Nothing was idle. Nothing was deceptive. And there was no confusion. We see when we look at the creation narrative that words are the mechanism by which the creative realm of thought is brought into the physical world. The words are the mechanism by which the creative realm of our thought is brought into the physical world. We talked about that concept a little bit when we were talking about how it could be actual adultery just to think of something in your mind, to lust in your heart, and how that was a tangible thing that we had committed, an offense against God. So there is that reality that what goes on in our mind actually is real in creation, is real in the world. Of course, we are not God, and we did not create the universe. That is something that some of us need to remind ourselves about every now and then. We are not God. Even so, we were created in God's image to be God's representatives in his creation. So language, this ability to communicate clearly and concisely, is a gift of God. It is according to the nature of God. So it is a gift that mankind was given to fulfill our mission on this earth. We were to use that gift to take dominion over all of creation that we might take and put all of creation under order in service to and in display of the glory of the creator. The language, which is in God, a perfect extension of his greater wisdom, desires, intentions, care, truthfulness, and faithfulness was intended to be in man an extension of our lesser wisdom, desires, intentions, care, truthfulness, and faithfulness. Well, as God's words come out of his nature, so our words are from our nature. And we go back to creation. In creation, our nature was perfect, though finite, compared to God's infinite if we look through the whole of Scripture, one of God's greatest and most oft-praised attributes is His faithfulness. We know that God can be trusted because He has always proven time and again that what He has said every time He has spoken will come to pass. God's words always coincide perfectly with reality, both in His intention and in the substance of his words. With God, everything that he says is yes and amen. Beloved, God has never had a careless thought. He has never uttered a careless word. And he has never performed a careless action. Our confidence in the past, in the present, and in the future are all based on God's word being faithful and true on God's word being dependable, on God's word existing perfectly with what is real. His promises must be sure. His word must be eternal if we are to have any hope now or in the age to come. So I say, beloved, that something that is so central to the person, to the character and the nature of our God, cannot be a small matter for those who were called by his name, the people of his own possession. Just think of the importance of the placements of these verses within this narrative, within this teaching section in the Sermon on the Mount right after Jesus' words on adultery and divorce. What greater oath do we swear commonly in our day-to-day lives than the covenant of marriage? Where we make a promise before God to be faithful to one person, to forsake all others in good and bad, in sickness and health, for rich or for, for, or for, for poorer, Till death do us part. That that is an oath that we swear when we make a covenant to our spouses. If people took their words seriously, 
if we took our promises and our vows seriously, the discussion of divorce and adultery wouldn't even have been necessary in this passage before. So beloved, if, if even that sacred vow that we have seen in Jesus' day was, was considered of little esteem, and we know when we look around us in the world today is of little esteem among the men around us, if that sacred vow was given such little place, considered so lowly, what hope can people have that any promises that a man will make can be counted on? If the greatest promise that men make are easily broken, how much the rest of what he says? See, I don't believe that we generally operate in our lives with much trust at all in our daily interactions with other people. I think we've, we've adjusted to assuming that people are going to break their word. We're adjusted to assuming that the only time that we can depend on somebody, if they are in their right mind, is when what they have agreed to do is already what they want to do and what is of the greatest personal benefit to them. That is simply not enough for a society to thrive. And it is certainly not enough for God's people to dwell with one another as, as in a family as we have been commanded. Well, as we read this morning in our confession paragraph for the week, in the fall of mankind, every aspect of what it means to be human became depraved and corrupt. So now in the fall, under this curse, in these bodies of death, our, the faithfulness of our words is no longer something that could be depended on. That was the state of man after the fall. It was no longer, everything that came out of his mouth was no longer perfectly in sync with what was true in reality. It was no longer perfectly in, in sync with what his intentions were, what his desires really were. So in his mercy, God gave us laws to preserve the human race, to curb the effects of sin, and ultimately to lead us to Christ. So what did God command concerning the words of men in the wake of sin after the fall? Well, to set the stage for Jesus' teaching that was read earlier, we are going to first walk through what had been commanded concerning oaths and swearing and vows in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at what the Pharisees and the scribes did with those commandments. One thing we, need, we ought to be clear about is that these passages that, that Jesus is quoting, like before this when Jesus said, you have heard, but I tell you, or it was written, but I say, he would be quoting largely a single passage of Scripture. What we have in this section here is actually quoting from multiple different passages or taking pieces from multiple different passages. We're going to look at those together quickly. First of all, we'll look at Leviticus 19, 11 and 12. So you can turn there with me if you would. Leviticus 19, 11 and 12, the third book in the Old Testament. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Next, if you turn just one book to the right, we'll look at Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Numbers 30, verse 2. There we read, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And one more time, look forward a little bit again in your Bible to Deuteronomy 23, verses 21 through 23. Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. And then we read, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it. 
For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what is past your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God that you have promised with your, with your mouth. One thing you notice as we read those particular passages, that they didn't speak actually to whether or not making a vow was right or wrong. And they simply regulated how one ought to make a vow. In other places, however, the law commanded the people of Israel to swear by the name of the Lord. Turn back a little bit in Deuteronomy to chapter 6, verse 13. We'll see a direct command in that nature. So Deuteronomy 6, 13. And there it's written, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. And by his name you shall swear. In that passage, it is clear that swearing by the name of the Lord is closely related to the fearing and serving of the Lord. It was akin to holding God up as someone's highest authority, as someone's highest standard. So to swear by his name was to claim the authority based on the most greatest, most powerful being we could imagine. If you continue on in that passage, you would see that for Israel to swear by any other name, for Israel to swear by any of the names of the false gods around them, would have been for them to follow in the pattern of the pagans and idolatry. Swearing by the name of the Lord was given to Jeremiah as a sign of the people's return to faithfulness to God, whereby he would bless them and rescue them. We can see that in Jeremiah 12, 15 through 17. So after Song of Solomon, Isaiah, and then Jeremiah. Chapter 12, 15 through 17. I'm just going to start in the second half of verse 14. Behold, I will pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them each to his heritage and each to his land. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people, to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear to Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people." But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pick it up and destroy it, declares the Lord. There's also one more example we're going to look at, or actually we're not going to look at. I'm just going to talk about from Numbers 5, uh, verses 19 through 22. And in that section, swearing an oath to the Lord was part of the process by which the priest could determine if a woman had actually been faithful or not to her husband. There was an account of if, a, if the spirit of jealousy overcame a husband, he was to go to a priest with his wife. There was a right that they were to follow and a swearing of oaths by the priest and by the wife. And it was by swearing on the name of the Lord that the truth of the matter was to be determined. So making a vow or an oath in another's name symbolized that it was they who had the absolute authority in the matter that they were the ones who were to hold you accountable at your word. In a way, to swear by another's name is an act of worship. It is a test of what a person believes in, what they hold as the most powerful, and what they believe possesses the greatest authority. Israel was called to both fear the Lord and to hold his name as the highest name above all names. Therefore, they were called to swear by his name and his name alone. Well, the law of God given to Israel also commanded them not to take the name of the Lord in vain. Most of us probably can remember what the third commandment is in Exodus 27. But since if you're anything like me, you've memorized these verses in a variety of different translations. Let's look at it together. Exodus 27. Exodus 
that we read, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Israel had been commanded to swear only by the name of the Lord, and then also commanded not to take his name, not to swear by his name in vain, not to falsely use his name. He warned them not to claim the authority of his name, to give credence to a lie, because that would be to profane the name of God. Of course, a natural question is just what does it mean to take the name of the Lord in vain? Well, many of us were taught, especially as young children, that that means that we're not to use the name of God or the name of Jesus flippantly as as a curse word or just like another word that we use as filler in our speech. Of course, that is one application of this command, surely, though perhaps not the one that's the most illustrative. To take the name of the Lord in vain includes making an oath by his name, so claiming his authority as surety of our word, and then failing to fulfill that oath. It also includes appealing to the name of God directly or indirectly through scriptures to give claim to, of authority to something that we think that God did not intend or say. In that case, it's essentially to claim God's authority by his name for our own agenda and for our own gain. It is to say that God has said, that God is the one who is speaking, that it is God who is the one who is giving the authority on something when it is simply us doing the talking according to our own wishes. So you see, there's, there's a fullness. There's, there's many ways that we can misuse the name of God, but to swear falsely by it is to claim his authority for our speech when it is, in fact, simply our words, which is a different thing entirely from reading from his word and saying, thus saith the Lord. When the Old Testament warned Israel to be very careful and intentional when they took an oath, There were times in the Old Testament where taking an oath was commanded. To swear by the name of the Lord was commanded, or in certain um, religious ceremonies was commanded. Of course, there are also times that taking an oath or swearing an oath in the Old Testament was something that was allowed, even if it was regulated and not mandated. And then, of course, there were times when taking an oath or swearing by a vow was great folly. It was not a matter to be taken lightly for common things. Let's recall some of the verses that we read earlier. If a man vows to the Lord, he shall do according to all that proceeds from his mouth. As well as if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you and you will be guilty of sin. So, And this is not by any means an exhaustive treatment of of making oaths or swearing in the Old Testament. But it does seem clear that there were both commands and allowances made in the Old Testament for oaths. Yet we have a passage before us today in which it seems that Jesus is contradicting or abolishing those commands. So when we see that something that we feel might be a contradiction, we need to keep digging if we're going to find out what is the solution. And just as a spoiler alert, when we understand the context of Jesus' words, we will find there is no contradiction here. Well, the law commanded Israel to swear by the name of the Lord and then gave them in great care and instruction on how to do so. What were the Pharisees teaching that caused Jesus to come up with such a radical statement in trying to correct what they had taught the people. What, caused, what was so bad that the Pharisees and scribes were doing and was commonplace among the people that Jesus would actually forbid the taking of oaths? When we look at the traditions that developed around swearing and making oaths, it becomes apparent that the only thing the Pharisees were concerned themselves with was that they didn't commit perjury. As long as they did not make a binding oath in regard to a legal matter and be proven false, 
They believed they had filled any and every regulation concerning the third commandment and concerning vows in general. So it was just a matter of whether or not something was actually binding on them. That was the concern. Their concern was only that they did not directly involve the name of the Lord as part of their deception. There was little to no concern about the faithfulness of a man's word, nor with the faith, his faithfulness to follow through with what he had promised. One commentator I read uh, suggested that their efforts actually changed the structure to, of the commandments of God to something like the following. That you shall not swear by the name of God falsely. Or when a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath, he shall not break his word. Or when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not be slack to pay it. Or you shall not break your oath, but have keep the oath you have sworn to the Lord. Would you catch the subtle differences from those statements, from those passages that we read earlier? God is interested in the honesty and dependability of his people and their promises. The scribes and Pharisees were interested in finding a way to keep a little wiggle room in their negotiations, to keep some room in there for them to be able to back out and to not fulfill their word. And because of that, they limited the scope of the command of God to only include and only relate to oaths that were made to God. So that things could only be binding and place someone into sin if an oath was made directly in his name. Well, so concerned were the Pharisees about committing perjury, they devised an intricate system by which they could swear to by things other than God's name, and those vows could either be binding or non-binding, depending on what they swore on. So depending on what they invoked in their oath, it might count or it might not count. Some things counted more than others. If you turn ahead in Matthew to Matthew 23, starting in verse 16, we'll look where Jesus deals a little more fully and gives us some examples of just what they were doing. So Matthew 23, 16 through 22. There Jesus says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone sw swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And if you say, if anyone says by the, swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men! For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and everything by him who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven by, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Of course, there Jesus went into a few more examples of just what the Pharisees were doing, of claiming one thing was binding and something else was not. Jesus understood the devious methods that the Pharisees had built into their system. A system that had become so complicated that there had to be a new specialty in law practice in order to have an expert that could devise whether or not an oath was binding or what type of oath was more serious than others. Yet, just think in the mind... Wasn't there something specifically mentioned about what God's people were supposed to swear concerning? Or what, what name they were supposed to swear by? Yeah, there was. They were commanded to swear by his name alone. Well, in swearing by things that were God-adjacent, the scribes and Pharisees claimed a sort of obedience to the spirit of the law. They weren't actually breaking oaths that were made to the name of the Lord. And at the same time, they were breaking the letter of the law because they were not swearing only by the name of the Lord. Remember in our passage today, Jesus warned the people not to swear by heaven, by earth, by Jerusalem, or by their own head. 
Remember, heaven was the throne of God. Earth was the footstool of God. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. And the head of man is the head, the image of God under his sovereign providence. To be able to, man can't so much as turn his hair from white to black. And if you think about it in a Jewish context, not a whole lot of blondes around them. So their hair went from black when they were young to white or gray as they got older. So man has no ability to shift where he is at in his lifeline. We cannot control our age. We cannot slow down time. We cannot prevent ourselves from decaying and falling apart. We have no ability even over ourselves to control our destiny. So they were swearing on things that they had no business swearing upon. The result of all this practice from the scribes and the Pharisees and that became common among the people was that people began to make vows and oaths for any and every reason. What was designed to be a very solemn and weighty experience when you were calling on the name of the Lord as a surety and a pledge of your seriousness and your commitments, accepting the consequences that came with that, but instead it became something that was common and meaningless as people swore upon objects that they believed held no power and had no ability to hold them accountable. But of course, that's kind of the point, is it not? The Pharisees and the scribes had enough sense to realize that they didn't dare to swear falsely directly in the name of the Lord. They knew that God was powerful and that God would be offended. Yet they felt they could outsmart him somehow and that the lesser power, the things that they would swear to, held, held no ability to hurt them, to cause them harm if they broke their word. So they called upon objects to convince others of their statements all the time while feeling innocent in their ability to defraud. Because what danger is there in swearing by a mere thing? Yeah, we know what happens when when people don't take their words seriously, when they start making frivolous promises. When promises of men are not trusted, men make even bigger and more bold claims, bigger and bigger statements to try and convince you that now, at this point, in this moment, I am being serious. Even if everything I had said before you know is a lie. Of course, soon nobody believes anything anybody says. And all relationships among men become built on deceit and on the advantage that one might be able to take over another. Just consider for a moment, how many people do you know that when they make a promise to you, when they make an agreement with you, you have complete confidence that they will be faithful to their word? How many people do you know like that? I would wager a great deal there are not many. Often in our lives and our dealings with people, we are actually surprised when somebody just remembers what they promised to do. If somebody can just remember, much less actually do it. If they just remember they told you they would do something, we're excited. Our bar has been set so low on our confidence in men. Beloved, this isn't how it is supposed to be. So let's turn our attention back now to the words of Jesus to his disciples. Just what did Christ mean when he commanded his disciples to make no oath at all? Was he, as what seems at first glance, was he going against and overriding the law that we had just looked at in the Old Testament? But didn't he already say that he hadn't come to abolish the law? Let's read his words again in Matthew 5. 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Well, it shouldn't come as any surprise that there have been a few gr groups of uh, people over the years that have taken these words just at straight face value, isolating these, this passage from the rest of Scripture, and have come to believe that any oath for any reason is impermissible. So movements such as the Quakers or cults like Jehovah's Witness have because of this passage refused under any condition to make an oath, be it in a court of law or anywhere else. Well, the question is, is that what Jesus intended in this passage? Because if it is what he intended, no matter how radical it is, no matter how much it makes our lives more difficult in society, we ought to obey if that's what he commanded. Of course, I believe the answer to that question is no, that's not what he was intending. I just want to give four brief reasons for that. First of all, God himself does not refrain from taking an oath. We are told that there is purpose in the taking of an oath that God gives to, in giving confirmation to what is said. So one great example of that is if you look with me in Hebrews chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 13. So Titus, Philemon, and then Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 13. And there we read, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desires to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. God throughout scripture makes promises, makes covenants, binds himself to his word with his people. He swears by his own name, even as he has commanded his people to swear by his name, because there is no higher name. There is no higher authority. God regularly uses his own name, his essence, his character as the proof and the surety of his word. Well, second, Jesus did not object to being under oath. You might ask, well, when was Jesus under oath? Well, he was under oath when he appeared before the high court, before his crucifixion. That is the practice of that time. When he was under oath, he made no effort to refrain from being under oath as a natural part of that proceeding. And Jesus remained silent. He refused to speak until he was commanded by the name of the Lord to respond and to speak. You can see that in Matthew 26, verse 63 and 64. Matthew 26, 63 and 64. Said, but Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Then Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So even from sinful men, Jesus gave weight something that was swearing by the name of God. Another example is when Jesus was pressed by the Pharisees in John 8 concerning the truthfulness of his judgments, he pointed to the law concerning witnesses, and he claimed that his testimony was true because it was confirmed by the testimony of the Father. Of course, what is an appeal to another witness, but an appeal to the dependability of that witness and their authority? 
So even if that's not directly taking an oath, Jesus did not shy from invoking the name of his father to lend the father's credibility to what he was saying. Of course, that is the essence of what it means to swear by somebody's name, is it not? And I will admit that that might be stretching just a little bit, but I think the principle is there. Third, having been under the instruction of Jesus, the apostles still practiced appealing to God as confirmation for what they were saying. Let's quickly look at two examples in the writing of Paul. The first one in Romans 1, 9 and 10. In Romans 1, 9 and 10, we read, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. And just one more quick example from Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, 23. And there Paul wrote, But I called God to witness against me, It was to spare you that I refrained from coming to you in Corinth. So the apostles, even knowing the teachings of Christ, did not interpret the teaching of Christ to be an absolute ban on on using the name of the Lord as, as swearing to the Lord or appealing to the name of the Lord for surety of speech. And fourth, we need to remind ourselves of the way that Jesus began this particular section in the Sermon on the Mount. Earlier in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, he said that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He labored to show the law's true purpose and meaning as he revealed the radical ethic of the kingdom of heaven. So pulling those things together, Jesus rejects not oath-taking in general, but the teachings of the Pharisees. He rejects that we can swear by things as a loophole and thus not be bound by our promises. Because everything is in creation is under God's authority. To appeal to something that God has created is still ultimately makes us liable to God. Jesus rejected the casual and the frivolous use of oaths among men as they were appealing to something greater for matters of no importance. He rejected the faithlessness of men and the emptiness of their words. So if Jesus was not making an absolute prohibition on the appealing to the name of God as confidence and authority to what we say, then just what is he calling us to in this passage? Well, Jesus is calling us to be children of our heavenly father. That we are to be people who are known by our dependable, faithful, and true nature and character. We should be so marked by truthfulness that we should be, should be considered that when we say yes, it is as binding as an oath. We should consider our no's to be absolute. People should know that when we speak, we do so with intention and care. Because to speak carelessly, to call heaven and earth to witness our words is evil. It's evil because it is foreign to the character and the nature of God. Because everything that is not of God is evil. Beloved, it really matters if we invoke the name of our God because we want to instill gravity and a sense of weight and importance and consequence to our words, or if we just use his name to show that this time we are finally being serious. Well, how should we respond to Christ's command? Are we to avoid any kind of swearing or making of an oath? Well, our confession can be of some help here in showing how godly men in the history of the church have understood the teaching of Jesus in this matter. Just look at a couple quick paragraphs of chapter 23 of our confession. People should swear by the name of God alone and only with the utmost holy fear and reverence. 
Therefore, to swear an empty or ill-advised oath by that glorious and awe-inspiring name, or to swear by anything else, is sinful and to be abhorred. Yet in weighty matters and significant matters, an oath is authorized by the word of God to confirm truth and end all conflict. It goes on in paragraph three to say, whoever takes an oath authorized by the word of God should consider to do it with due gravity, the seriousness of such a weighty act, and to affirm nothing in it except what one knows to be true. For the Lord is provoked by an ill-advised, false, and empty oath. Because of this, the land mourns. Well, there are some other things that we can take away from this passage I think the greatest thing we should take away is that we ought to consider our words carefully. There's one quick passage to look at in Matthew 12, 36 through 37. There we read, I tell you on the day of judgment... People will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. These are truly sobering words. Beloved, we cannot just say anything and everything that comes into our minds. We must be more intentional and careful than that. With our words we have the power to build up, and with our words we have the power to tear down. God does not consider the things that go on in our mind and our thoughts as of little importance. Of course, we have already seen you can be guilty of murder or adultery just by what goes on in the dwelling of our minds. Even so, there are many things that pass through our minds that battle in our hearts for attention and affection that we must wrestle with. We must fight against before we allow anything to escape from our tongue. Because something once said can never be unsaid. We must be careful about how we show God, how we reflect God, by how we defend his word, or what we use his word to defend. We cannot use the name of God to defend our preferences or our thoughts just because we really want something to be true and we really think it's a good idea does not mean that we can say, thus saith the Lord. It is either found in his word or it is your word. The greatest enemies of the faith have long used the word of God to defend all manners of abomination. So we must use great care to use God's word and use it correctly in context. That would apply both to our claiming that the Spirit of God led us to something or showed us something, as well as to ripping his words out of context. Second, when we make a promise, we must be faithful to stand by that promise. We are not free to go back on our words simply because we have changed our mind or because it is no longer convenient for us. Christ calls us to be bound by our yes and our no, whether or not any official oath has taken place. That truth does not change, does not allow us to, from, to refrain from keeping our word when things get difficult. A uh, section from the Westminster Confession actually is, I think, very helpful in this. And it says, an oath cannot oblig- oblige to sin, but in anything not sinful being taken, it binds to performance, although to a man's hurt. So just think of that kind of serious level of taking an oath. That unless it would cause us to sin, we must be a people that will stand by our word. It is one thing if if after an arrangement is made, all parties can come together and decide that something else is to a mutual benefit or to be changed, agreed upon. But to simply decide we no longer want, want to honor what we have promised because things haven't turned out like we thought they would is faithless. That we have to be so committed to our word because we are committed to speaking as God speaks, to speaking in truth and faithfulness that we are willing to follow through with the promise even to our hurts. Third, we need to refuse empty or frivolous promises. 
We need to be much more careful on what we promise, what we say we will do. As parents, we all can think of a uh, myriad of things that we've told our kids just, just to get them off our back, just to give us a moment for something else. Like, yeah, 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 we'll do that later. We make promises all the time and give no thought to it. We have created a system where it is more tolerated to make a promise and then break it than it is to not make a promise in the first place. Think of how backwards that is. It is more accepted to say, yes, I will do that. I will give this and then break it with no intention to follow through than it is to say, no, I can't do that. I can't give that and be done with it up front. Somehow we still get credit for being nice, even when in actuality we're saying no. And even when the people we promise something to have no expectation that we're going to follow through. We need to be more careful with what we say. Because what does it say about us when we are eager and quick to make a promise and then even more quick to break a promise? It says we are more concerned with looking generous than actually being generous. It says we care more for saving face than we do for the needs of others. Beloved, if we say no and mean no, we should not be talked into saying yes. And if we say yes and mean yes, we should not allow a little inconvenience or cost to stand in the way of our keeping our promise. And finally, we ought to consider our witness. Consider what it says to the world when those who bear the name of our God are untrustworthy. What is the world going to think of our God when his people do not keep their word? When his people speak carelessly? When we say one thing and we think another. Think about the testimony and the faithfulness of, of the faithfulness of God that the world would see if his people would be a people known that when they say yes, they mean yes. You don't may, need to make a promise with them. Then they say yes, they mean it. Or if they say no, they mean it. What kind of testimony would that give to a world who has learned that they cannot trust anything anybody says, that these people over here, when they say something, they mean it and they follow through. You want something in your life that will cause people to, to question and answer, what is the reason for this? How can you live like this? That we can easily point to our Father in heaven. It is to be a, a man or a woman of your word. And think about how much joy and comfort there would be among the body of Christ if we really knew that we could depend on one another, that we could trust what each other says, and not always feel deep down that we can't trust what we hear. So, beloved, think on this. And then do what we have been commanded to do. Be what we have been commanded to be. And trust that he will be faithful to do in you and in me what he has promised to do. All to the glory of his name. Father, we do ask that your spirit would work in us things that are impossible for us. This, this, this sermon, this passage stung me. When I think about how often I, I give my word carelessly, I speak things that I haven't thought through. I say things that I don't really intend to follow through with. And I become more concerned with avoiding an awkward situation in the moment than I do with breaking my word. Father, may this not be true of your people. May we look to your son and see his perfect faithfulness, his careful words, and follow his example. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
We come now as we do each week to the Lord's table. Where we accept and bring into our bodies these these tangible reminders of what God has done for us. Clinging to the promise, the sure word of God, that the sacrifice, the broken body and shed blood of his son, that we take to ourselves anew, not as not that he is being re-sacrificed, but we reaffirm our dependence on Christ, that we act out something now that is true of us each and every moment of our lives when we cling to the sacrifice, the finished work of Christ. And we do this because we know his word is true. We know that he is faithful. So consider the faithfulness of God, both to do what he said he would do in sending his son, and the sure confidence that we have that we will one day be freed from this body of death in the presence of our Lord because of what he has done for us. And take of these elements in the same manner of faith that day by day you cling to Christ. May it restore your soul and give you extra grace and a measure of comfort in Christ. So I invite you to come forward now uh, to take of the elements and then we'll, or to grab them and we'll take them together in just a moment. Join me in prayer once again. Father, we are thankful for this tangible reminder that you have commanded us to observe as we gather together in remembrance of what your Son has done for us. A physical representation of how we depend on and cling to Christ every moment of our existence. As we are thankful knowing that even as we feel that we cling to your Son, we know that is. He and that is you that are holding on to us. Use us as an encouragement to our souls, strengthening of our faith. And give us comfort that everything that could possibly be done to make us right with you has already been done. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Read in Matthew 26, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he had taken, took a cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And as God has proven dependable and faithful in everything that he has said in the past, we look forward to it, we long, we ache, We feel pain in our mortal bodies as we wait for that day. We can drink the cup anew with our Father, with our Savior in the kingdom, the consummation of the age.